For several years, we've talked about the consequences of inadequate access to prenatal care for both birthing parents and children. We're here today with Laura Stone, a risk management analyst at ECRI, to talk about a new emerging risk, one that we thought was eradicated, but is making a big comeback. Laura, we've seen in recent years a huge increase in the rate of congenital syphilis in newborns. Can you give us an idea of the scope of that increase? Sure, Paul. So this rate really is alarming. Um, we saw in 2022 that more than 3,700 babies were born with congenital syphilis, and that number is 10 times the number that we saw back in 2012. Further, there were more than 200 stillbirths and more than 50 infant deaths in 2022. All related to congenital syphilis. All related to congenital syphilis, yep. So, Laura, some basics, right? Mm -hmm. When I hear syphilis, I think of it as an STI. How does an infant then become infected? So, right, syphilis is an STI sexually transmitted infection. Congenital syphilis means that a baby contracted syphilis in utero. Hmm. So it's the same exact disease. Congenital okay. syphilis is syphilis. The difference is, you know, when the baby got it, right? It, it came through the placenta, whereas something like herpes would come during uh, delivery through the, the vaginal canal. Syphilis happens, you know, during the actual pregnancy. Okay. And, and it is the same bacteria, so it is the same disease. So you mentioned stillbirth, you mentioned deaths. What are some of the other consequences that happen when children are born with syphilis infection? Sure, Paul. So, you know, miscarriage, stillborn, infant death are probably the worst outcomes, but even the babies that do survive can have anemia, they can have bone malformations, um, they can be blind, deaf, or they can uh, develop some developmental delays later on if they are not treated appropriately. So, ECRI and others have talked about this as an example of preventable harm. Why is that? So rates had been decreasing during the previous century, like you said, and really in the 90s, we were really hopeful that this would be completely eradicated. And then things started to shift, and we'll get into why in a little bit. Um, but really, 90% of those babies born in 2022 with congenital syphilis, that could have been prevented with timely testing and treatment. And half of those babies uh, were born to somebody who did receive testing, but then didn't get that treatment. And then about 40% were born to somebody with no maternal health care at all during pregnancy. So no opportunity to test and treat. Exactly. If this is preventable, mm -hmm. why is it not being prevented? Well, that is the million dollar question, <laughs> Paul. So there's a whole host of reasons for why someone's not getting uh, tested or treated later on. Uh, we're going to talk about three major ones today, but really some of these barriers are individualized. So the first one I want to talk about is stigma. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stigma surrounding syphilis and STDs um, broadly. You know, someone may be offended if they don't understand why their provider is offering treatment in a way that they wouldn't get offended if their provider is offering another, um, you know, glucose Mm -hmm. screening, for example. You know, they're wondering, well, what are, you, what are you suggesting? What are you trying to say about me as a person? Um, they may also be asymptomatic. A lot of adults are. Or depending on what stage of syphilis they are in, those symptoms may have gone away. Mm -hmm. So in earlier stages of syphilis, you might have sores, you may have rashes, and that might last a few weeks, and then it goes away. You know, without treatment, you will go into the latent stage of syphilis and any symptoms you have may go away. So if you didn't get tested in those you know, primary and secondary stages, you may think, well, whatever that was, it's gone now and I'm fine. Um, but you're not. And if it gets into that tertiary stage, it could be really harmful for you. It can affect uh, a lot of organs, brain damage. And if you get pregnant, obviously that's going to pass on to your child. You could still pass syphilis on even if you have it in a latent stage. Mm. Um, and a lot of people worry about any legal or punitive actions. You know, if someone's pregnant and they suspect that they have syphilis, they may worry about getting tested because what if my baby gets taken away? What if I lose custody of my other children? Mm. So that stigma is a real big factor for a lot of people. 
Another barrier, and nobody wants me to say this word in 2024, is that COVID-19 disruption that we saw a couple of years ago, right? Mm. A lot of people delayed or postponed preventive care services, including STI screenings. And a lot of public health dollars shifted from STI screening towards combating you know, this needed new virus and, and how to come up with ways to identify and treat that. Um, another thing that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic was this embracing of telehealth. Mm. And telehealth is really great, Paul. I mean, it <laughs> has eliminated a lot of barriers, a lot of transportation and other access barriers. But if someone's only getting you know, primary OB care through telehealth, that doctor's only seeing the person in a box. Right. They're not seeing other areas of their body. They're not picking up on other clues. And obviously, you're not getting tested for screening if you're remote. So although telehealth has had a lot of pros, we do need to think about this impact on the syphilis crisis. And lastly, Paul, we do have a maternal care deserts. And I'm sure you're familiar with maternal care deserts, but for those people who are not, it's a county that has no access to maternal OB services. So no hospitals that do deliveries, no birthing centers, no OB providers or nurse midwives. And there are also these areas that have limited access as well. And what happens is sometimes this county doesn't have access, this county doesn't have access, and this one, and, and you're surrounded by counties that have no or limited access. So to go and get treatment, you're having to travel very far to do so. And we're seeing then that this is disproportionately affecting people who already have maternal disparities. Um, babies born to black, Hispanic, Native American mothers are more than eight times as likely to get congenital syphilis than those born to white mothers. And there's a lot of disparities in location with babies born in the American South or Southwest having higher rates of congenital syphilis. And we can tie that right back to that lack of, just lack of availability of, of appropriate prenatal care. Exactly. So Laura, when I hear that this is preventable harm, and it's something that we had almost eradicated but is now coming back, that suggests to me that there must be some strategies that providers can take to, to get this moving back in the right direction. Do we have some, some suggestions there? Of course, Paul. So screening, screening, more screening, mm. right? We need to be screening all patients, right? Men and women who are of reproductive age, who are sexually active, and especially if they are planning on becoming pregnant or impregnating their partner. You know, we can't break the chain of infection if we're only focused on screening pregnant patients, right? Mm. Um, so that's really key. But for those pregnant patients, we should be screening as early as possible in pregnancy. So ideally this would take place at, you know, the initial prenatal visit or whenever pregnancy is confirmed. So that might take place in an urgent care center or in an emergency room, and those facilities do need to be prepared. We should also be screening at 28 weeks and again at delivery if um, you know, they're at higher risk, if there's no documentation of prior screening, if they have a past history of syphilis, or if they're in an area with high syphilis rates. Mm. So Paul, some states actually require screening for all pregnant patients at all three of those stages. So providers should be aware of their state-specific guidelines. So next, urgent cares and emergency departments do play a role in this. Like mm -hmm. I said, they may be the place that a person finds out that they are pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so urgent cares and emergency rooms should adopt policies to conduct rapid syphilis screenings for all pregnant patients regardless of the reason for that patient's visits. Next, let's talk about some treatment options, and I'm not gonna get into you know, the diagnostic and clinical logistics of that, but there are a few risk management considerations uh, that we should have in mind. Mm -hmm. And the first is that um, you know, syphilis is safe to treat during pregnancy, but we only have one drug at this point in time that's been approved to do so. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there is a drug shortage. If you're in an area that is experiencing you know, low volumes of that drug, if your you know, local pharmacy you know, doesn't have as much stock, you should prioritize those drugs towards patient women. Now, what did I say earlier about treating the partners? If that's the case, you need to be providing some non-sexual uh, education to those 
partners so they're not reinfecting their patients if they themselves can't get that treatment. Yeah. And then lastly with treatment, um, you know, we should be talking about uh, the dosing schedule. If you're caught, or if you are tested and you're in the early stages of syphilis, it's a single dose injection. But if you're in a later stage, it's three doses, one week apart. And it is one week apart, Paul. Like if you're <laughs> day nine, it's over. And the treatment is considered inadequate and you have to start again. So we should be eliminating those barriers and coming up with creative ways that get those pig pregnant patients back to get that second and third dose. And then lastly, I wanna talk about infants because about half of infants born with congenital syphilis are asymptomatic, or the mm. symptoms don't show up until a few days later when that baby has been discharged. No infant should be discharged from a hospital without that documentation of testing. And then, you know, the, the parents should be sent home if, you know, they were, if they had syphilis, if they were exposed with information about some signs and symptoms to look out for and how to come back. But um, really, Paul, you asked about what providers can do. And I've, I've been hinting at this a little bit throughout that it could be bigger, it is bigger than what one provider, what one organization can do. You know, we need to be addressing these maternal care deserts, um, improving health disparities in maternal care. We need to be coming up with more and better diagnostic testing, especially for infants. And we should be finding alternative treatments so that patients don't have to come in three times to get three different doses. Because without this, you know, the crisis is, is going to get worse. Laura, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for watching ECRI Now. You can find more insights from the experts on YouTube and at ECRI.org. Until next time, I've been your host, Paul Anderson.